Okay, we'll continue here with just a few other items. Um, as I said before, I like to write little scripts that add all my users. I can usually start out with a script that looks something like, or just a list of files that look something like this, that have nothing but usernames in them. And by writing little Emacs macros, I can fundamentally turn that into something like looks like this that will add all my users in about five minutes or so. So it's a pretty quick process to add 30 to 50 users, although it does take a little time to manually set their passwords. In this case, uh, because the groups are, uh, the users are always, always being added to the group um, 100, I don't need to generate groups for them. If I'm on a system that keeps a group per user, then I have to be careful to make sure I use the group add command to create a group before I use the add user command to add a person to that group. So that, that, that's the main thing there. Okay. Let, Oh my, I hit a carriage return here. I think I just added Moshi as, as a user by accident when I meant to cancel that command. But um, let's see if I did this for sure. Whoops. Oh, now I lost the whole point there. That adds Moshi back in. Let's go back here and let's check to see if he is on the system. Indeed, he is. He got added to my system. To delete him, there is a user delete command, which um, the uh, uh, minus R option on this, I think, says delete his home directory. Kill all of his home directory as well as the user Moshi. That gets rid of him. And if I look at the password file again, he's gone. If I look at the home directory, there's no Moshi. He's gone. So that's the way I add. That's the way I delete a user. Now, I would never, ever delete a user. I do not delete users. I don't know if the book talks about this or not, but I really recommend never deleting users. Moshi was an exception because I added him by accident. He wasn't a real user. I added him by accident. Deleting him was just fine. However, if I've had this user on the system for quite a while, I will not delete him. Suppose he or she goes away. They, they used to be an employee. They're no longer an employee. I will not delete them because I want to keep their files, although I can if I don't use the minus R option on the delete user, user delete command, um, I will keep their files. But I probably want to keep their files. I probably want to keep some record of them. Uh, for one thing, maybe they'll come back. To a lot of people I've had work for me. They work for me for a few months. They go away. They come back a year later, work for me a year. They go away. They come back. People have a tendency to come back. So I don't want to get rid of them. Um, sometimes they volunteer some time with the organization. So um, I still want them to have accounts. Um, maybe I want their dis account disabled for a while. Maybe they were a crook, and I want to make sure that I've got enough evidence that I can convict them. Who knows? But because I don't ever want to use issue that UID number again, I think it's a good thing not to delete them. And I will rarely delete a user. Instead, what I will do is I will go back to the um, password file. I will go into the password with file with an editor. And I will simply change their shell. Whoops. Um, I don't have access to write here. I wasn't uh, root. But if I was root, I would then change their shell from being um, slash bin bash to being um, slash s bin no login or slash bin false. And that would take care of the problem. They could no longer log in. Or maybe I'd change their password to something really obscure, although it's more secure to uh, change their login shell or maybe do both. 
and um, then they, they they can't log in, and uh, they've been disabled on the system. If they come back, it's really easy to enable them again. Um, so I think that's much better than deleting users off the system. OK, last topic. This is a pain. Installing these users on every system, suppose I have 100 Unix systems out there, or 1,000 Unix systems, and I've got 1,000 users, and I've got to install each of these 1,000 users on 1,000 systems. Let's see, that's, that's 1 million users I have to install. That is kind of painful. Even with a shell script, that's a little bit painful. Um, and I'll never get, keep all those password files in sync. Every, things are going to get screwed up. There's got to be a better way. Well, there is a better way. There's actually two better ways. They are a little bit beyond the scope of the uh, book, so we're not going to talk about them in detail, but I want to tell you they exist. The first system is a system called Yellow Pages, which was written by Sun Microsystems way back when. Um, they got in trouble over this system. Uh, they got sued by British Telecom or somebody somebody in Britain because who claimed Yellow Pages was a uh, trademark name and you couldn't use the name Yellow Pages. So Sun renamed the system to be Network Information System, NIS. But you will notice to this day all the commands begin with the letters YP. Um, which sounds like yellow pages to me. But um, but the official name of the system is NIS. And what Network Information Systems does is you kind of have a master system where you do all of your upgrades and you add your, your users and everything on this master system. And then once a day or twice a day or once a week, however you schedule it, the network information system takes information from the master system and copy and and moves that to all of the other uh, Linux or Unix systems you have in the network, and then it uses that information to add the users or make the changes it needs to make on all the other systems in your network. And there's ways to build redundancy in it so that you know, you don't have, you're not dependent on one server serving the entire network, even though you've got computers all over the world. You can have, uh, what, intermediary systems. And um, it's sort of a little bit like, works a little bit like the DNS systems, the domain name services, only this is for uh, updating a systems administration information on a network of Unix computers or Linux computers. Um, it's a good system. I don't think it's very widely used today. I, I'm not sure. Um, that's a system I actually recommended BLM use, and BLM did indeed use that for a while. It was a good system. I believe it's been displaced a little bit by another system called Active Directory. Active Directory, which is widely used in the Windows world, is also used in the Linux Unix world, where um, it's called LDAP, um, L-D-A-P, lightweight something or another. But, um, but it, it's, it's basically Microsoft's um, Active Directory system. And there you keep a database with all your user information and the um, and I think that can propagate out to some subcomputers as well. But the um, uh, the computer, every time you log on, uh, anytime you log on, the login information then goes back and checks with the uh, checks the Active Directory system and gets the all the stuff that should be in the password file is kept in the Active Directory on a server instead of being kept on the local machine, and that allows you to log on. Uh, and of course, there's ways of dividing this up where you can have some users, a few users stored in the local password information. And then anybody that's not stored there, it checks the uh, Active Directory information. And that's a good way of doing things that is widely used. Um, 
and um, yeah, it's widely used. There's a lot of things you can do with um, um, user access information that are beyond what we've done here. Another thing you can do is you can have it where people can receive and um, um, can receive email on a system or send email from a system where they're logged into a um, where their accounting information is kept in a separate database that has nothing to do with the user database on the system so that people can receive email on a system that they don't actually have an account on. ISPs like that system because it uh, gives them a lot better security than the idea that they'd have to add a full account for anybody that just simply wanted to receive email on their system. I mean, if you know, that would drive Google wild if they had to do that with Gmail. Um, OK. So um, the book talks about um, uh, managing groups, but I think we've pretty well covered that in our discussion of it, managing users. And um, I think that's really everything I have to talk about on uh, managing users. And uh, I, uh, one other thing, though, because users are determined by the UID numbers, suppose I would go to my password file, and I go down in my password file here, and I would find a line that has somebody like, you know, um, hacker man that has a um, funny, I don't see root here offhand, but, but has a UID of 0. What would that mean? 0 is the UID of root, right? So anybody who has the UID of zero basically has root rights. So one of the things, if I ever found somebody in my password file that wasn't root, that had a UID of root, I would really start looking and seeing if somebody had hacked into my system or crack, cracked my system. And uh, I'd just, boy, I'd really be looking for root kits and things like that. And I'd, yeah, I'd be seriously concerned. OK, um, having said that, I think that is the final thing that I wanted to say. And um, so have a good day. Bye-bye.